or not. And okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is LaPrey George. I am the Senior Director of Chapters, Members, and University Relations here at the National Headquarters of the National Black MBA Association. I am honored to be a part of today's webinar. We have had a long history with the PhD project, so I'm joined by some of the original individuals that helped to launch the partnership. And uh, today we are really kind of be embarking upon reinvigorating the relationship to make it stronger than ever before and really re-engage because our members have expressed an interest uh, in understanding what the PhD can do for them as a, as a business person, for them as an individual, and just for anyone that's looking to retain any individual goals. Um, so great information is going to be shared today. I'm going to, I'm not going to say a whole lot. I don't, I don't want to steal anyone's thunder. Um, so to get this e event rolling, I want to introduce you uh, to Mr. Blaine Ruschak. I believe I said that correctly, Blaine Ruschak. <laughs> He is with the PhD project, also with K KPMG, and he will take us through our agenda and then he will begin to share um, a little bit about PhD projects. So without further ado, Blaine, the floor is yours and I will advance your slide as you tell me. Thanks, LaPrey, and I guess I get to be the first part of Thunder. Um, I'm very excited to be here today welcoming everyone, whether it's morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you're calling in from. I'm the president of the PhD project but have a very, very long history um, with the PhD project. I've been with KPMG for 39 years, um, in, including 20 years overseeing campus recruiting. And I just have seen the value in being able to recruit at schools that truly embraced diversity and diverse faculty, which led to you know, um, a more diverse classroom and eventually diverse professionals for us. And the PhD project has been around for 26 years. Um, and I think it's a, a testament to say that any program that can start and stay you know, in existence and get bigger and stronger and better for 26 years is pretty amazing. Um, and the premise is pretty easy. LaPrey, if you could go to the next schedule, next um, slide, please. One more. You know, it's about increasing diversity in the workplace. And I will say that I was around 26 years ago when Bernie Milano and some others that you'll hear names mentioned on the call today sat around and said, you know, there's a lack of diversity in our business schools. Why is that? And there was a hypothesis. You know, possibly it's because diverse students do not see any diverse faculty. There's no one like themselves when they go and look at a school um, at the majors in business. And so they don't major in it and they don't go to those schools. And so they started the PhD project with the understanding that maybe if we diversified the classroom, that would increase diversity of the student population, which would then increase more diverse professionals. And I'm gonna go one step further in the hopes that they had become successful professionals. And then one day decide they wanna go get their PhD and go back into the classroom and be that mentor and role model. So it's, it's, an, it's an amazing model that has worked consistently for 26 years. Next slide, LaPrey. So our approach, um, it's focused on the, the Black, the Latin, Latinx and Hispanic and Native American Indian population. Um, and the idea is attract them from successful business careers like many of you on this call are joining and saying, you know, I, I, I'm having a successful career right now. You know, why a PhD? So hopefully after today's discussion, you will see the passion, um, the enthusiasm, the reasons why people decided to go this route. Um, I personally believe so much in education. I was a, both an undergraduate and graduate student. I was a TA, I was an adjunct faculty. And I will say that the one thing that was missing from my whole academic career was when I went through school, I had zero faculty of color, zero at, two, at three universities. So what this model is saying, we need to diversify the classroom. It's a better place when there's a more diverse thought. Um, so it's not just about the role model of of a diverse student with a diverse faculty member, that's important. But it's also, you know, the, the, the kind of the majority student who has not had exposure to that diverse faculty member. So this model brings that all together. So uh, hopefully in today's session, you will be engaged enough to want to apply for a November conference. Um, and I'm not gonna talk about the November conference anymore because your panelists will, and that's one of the most exciting things we do. Next slide, please, LaPrey. You can see the name of, of the companies that are invested in KPMG, founding member foundation of 26 years ago, but also some other organizations that have been around with us from day one. You can see it's a combination of financial service companies, associations, school, um, so a big, a diverse group of, of sponsors that believe in the project and what we do and what we're able to attain and see the future of what we're able to do um, in today's environment. Next slide, LaPrey. Uh, so 
what we're envisioning is, is a kind of a, a world where um, students see leaders and see people that they can look up to, mentors that look like them, um, that they have unlimited opportunities. So they're not kind of pigeonholed into one particular area or discipline. Um, and it's not just the faculty, right? That's the starting point, become a faculty member, become the teacher, the researcher. But now we have so many in the PhD project who have become department chairs, deans, provosts, and now university presidents. So they're making an impact on more than just the classroom. Um, bigger and better and, and more impact um, and hopefully changing the way we think about diversity in the business world. Right, next slide, Lepre. This chart just shows, you know, th there's, there's an increasing demographic of, of minorities, you know, the Black, Hispanic, Latinx community, um, but the same percent increases have not occurred in the faculty in terms of the, the, the faculty in front of the classroom. And so that's what our goal is to, to not only keep up with, but hopefully someday maybe even, you know, um, exceed that, that percentage where we have more uh, faculty of color in the classroom and at universities and administrative and leadership roles to help make a difference. So, so that, that's our, our goal here is get more and more of you to be considered getting a PhD and become that role model. Okay. Next slide, Lepre. And this is an important slide. You, you think about, well, so what if I do this? What if I you know, go get my PhD? Well, what's the impact going to be? Because I think we're all looking at purpose and, and what's our impact in life. Think about if you're a, a professor and you teach even just two classes in the spring and the fall, so four a year, and let's say that you start your academic career at age 40. So I'm just going to pick that, but say 40 and you, and you, and you work to your 65, so 25 years. And I don't think that's uncommon in the academic world. So 25 years of teaching four classes, that's 100 classes, I'm sorry, 1,000 classes, and each class has 50 students. That's a huge impact in terms of the number of students. And those students go on to become professionals in the business world that go on to impact people. So your impact is tremendous, right? And so if you're like me where you get kind of a, a, a buzz from just seeing people that, you know, your students in classroom, get it, understand it, and then move on successful careers and get promoted, um, th then I think you really wanna pay attention here because the opportunity to impact students and do research that's making a difference in your business discipline, interesting things that you choose to do, and your panels will talk about that. I just think that there's, a, there's a very few other careers that have that type of option. Um, so next slide, Lepre. So I have the distinct honor now to turn over to Dr. Bloxon, who um, is a joy, she's always smiling. Um, I just learned a little bit more about her on today's call and her, her travel. So she's gonna be the moderator and uh, I'm gonna turn over to her because we have some great, great panelists who are gonna you know, talk about you know, why they, they pursued the PhD route. So Dr. Bloxon, off to you. Thank you so much, Blaine. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lakita Bloxon, Dr. Bloxon, and I'm professor of management at the at Adam Scott College in Decatur, Georgia, and also serve as the director of the Social Innovation um, Magic Master of Arts program. So what I wanna do is share with you some information about why we pursued an academic career. Next slide, please. So first, let me tell you what the role of a business professor is. And there are four major roles. The first one, as you can imagine, and no doubt had this experience, you know, that we teach undergraduate, graduate, and doctoral courses in the business disciplines. So um, we, that's one thing that we do. So if you've taken a business course before, that's one of the roles that we as faculty members play as business professors. The second major role is that we create knowledge through theory development and academic field research. So we are positioned, we are trained through our doctoral programs to be scholars. And that's one of the major roles that we play in being able to conduct research and then to go to the third point to publish that research and to disseminate the knowledge that we gain and we share with others, whether they're students, whether they're other scholars, whether they are business professionals in the field, whether it's the public at large and, and other institutions as well. Yes, we do publish research in journals and books Primarily in the business disciplines, we publish in journals. Um, other disciplines such as the humanities and the arts and some of the social sciences may primarily publish in books. Our major form of academic currency is through the publishing in, of articles in journals. And then lastly, our major role is to provide service to the university and the greater community. So we are engaged in playing a role in the governance of our respective campuses as well as being able to serve as a great partner within our greater communities, both where our universities or institutions are held 
and in our home community to spell and to be able in many times to serve as that liaison or a bridge among various stakeholder groups and community groups. Next slide, please. So you may wonder, well, what are the various paths to a PhD in business? And there are several paths. So some of you may already have an MBA or a master's degree or in the pursuit of a, a master's degree. That's wonderful. We're happy about that. But you do not necessarily need a master's degree to pursue a PhD in business. So there are several paths that one could take. Of course, you definitely would need an undergraduate degree. But you can, in, in some cases, um, go straight from an undergraduate degree, maybe have some work experience, then go for a master's degree, and then go for the PhD. Or an undergraduate degree, go straight into a master's program, and then straight into a PhD program. And you may introduce work in some other capacity. So there are a number of routes that we can take. And in fact, there are some schools and in some programs where students at the undergraduate level, after you earn an undergraduate degree, they may go straight into a PhD program in business. Now, oftentimes, depending on the program and depending on the school, a student may be required to take some business courses at the graduate level or the master's level, such as accounting, um, policy, finance, and the like, to serve as a bridge, particularly if they do not already have an undergraduate degree in business. And just also let you know, you don't need an undergraduate degree or a master's degree in business to pursue a PhD in business. So we have lots of um, colleagues of ours who have backgrounds in engineering, backgrounds in, in various sciences and the STEM fields, in sociology, psychology, economics and the like, who decide to actually pursue a PhD in business. Next slide, please. So just to give you a quick overview of the doctoral program process, there are generally three major stages to the process. There's a fourth stage introduced here because it is applicable in some cases, but generally the three stages in the doctoral program process are the coursework stage, the exam stage, and the dissertation stage. So during the coursework stage, which is usually between 18 months to two years, that's the phase where you're taking seminars and you're um, taking courses at the doctoral level. And those courses will fall in primarily three major categories. One for your discipline or department. So if you choose a particular discipline, um, you'll take courses in that discipline. In my case, my discipline was in business strategy and ethics. So macro management topics. So that was my major discipline. You'll also take classes in research methods such as statistics, um, quantitative methodologies and qualitative methodologies as well in some cases. So you will definitely take courses in those areas to be able to develop those skills and enhance those skills. And then you'll also take some courses that provide for breadth and cross-disciplinary um, integration. So you may take classes in another or take courses that may otherwise may be considered a minor in some support areas such as maybe marketing. Or in some cases, you might take courses outside of the business school to provide that cross-disciplinary breadth and depth. In my case, I took classes in economic development and public policy. In other cases, it may be in economics, it may be in information science, it may be in education or in health in healthcare management. So depending on the nature of the program, and depending on the, the options that that program offers, you may be able to study um, topics in a, as a support area within and or outside of the business school. Once you complete your coursework, you will then go into the exam phase, the comprehensive exams. And most of the, the exams that are administered at the comprehensive exams are written and oral. Now, there are some schools that will make, have just only written exams. There are some schools that will have only oral exams, but generally most doctoral programs in business will have a set of exams where they are both the written component and an oral component. And you are not able to progress to the dissertation stage until you have um, completed successfully your comprehensive exams. And then the third stage is the dissertation stage. So this is a stage where you are conducting some pre-dissertation research, so you might take, do some research either during the coursework phase, during or as you're preparing, preparing for exams, and or soon after you complete the exams and you're now trying to narrow down on a topic. So during the dissertation stage, that's when you are preparing to defend your dissertation proposal on what you would like to study. 
you are then will go through the process of actually, you know, developing the theory around the topic of or question of interest for your study. And then we'll go through the data collection and data analysis stages. And then the lastly, once everything is written, that's when you will actually defend your dissertation. And once you successfully defend the dissertation is when you are officially um, considered a, a, a doctor or earned a doctorate. Next slide, please. So quickly, I highlighted this a little bit earlier. The critical skills that you will need to pursue a business degree, in, a doctorate in business are quantitative skills and qualitative. So again, the quantitative skills, definitely you will take courses in statistics and you will, um, will definitely need to be able to brush up on your calculus and, ma and mathematics skills. Now the level depends on the discipline and the research that you're conducting, but it does not hurt to have a refresher in some of these areas. From a qualitative standpoint, you will learn during this PhD program or during a PhD program, how to write like an academician. No doubt you have read a journal article before for a class that you may have taken in your programs, in your respective programs in your career. So you will learn during the doctoral program process how to actually write like an academician and to publish in academic journals. Now, there are ways that you will also learn and you may learn to write for the business press and for other audiences, but primarily through the doctoral program, you will learn how to transform, translate the knowledge and the, the data and the, the um, new, new knowledge that you've gained through your studies into an academic writing product. Next slide, please. All right, so I want to dovetail from what Blaine mentioned earlier in terms of the results of all the work that we have done in the, um, the power of the PhD project. In the last 25 years, we have quintupled the number of underrepresented business school faculty. And we have been able to um, outperform the, the rate of growth in the number of um, underrepresented business faculty and business faculty altogether in the United States. So we are able to successfully say that we have a doctoral program completion rate of over, of, um, of, um, over 97% where um, typically um, PhD students um, may not, uh, outside the PhD project may not complete a PhD um, at the same rate and the like. So no doubt you have heard of people say that I am all, I'm ABD, I'm all but dissertation. They may have started a PhD program or a doctoral program, may have gone through the coursework phase, may have gone through the comprehensive exam phase, but for whatever reason or another may have not actually finished the um, dissertation and, and defended it. We are very proud of the fact that we've been able to, again, quintuple the number of faculty, underrepresented business faculty, and be able to have a high retention rate of how many complete the programs and how many stay on and pursue a career as faculty members. So we're really excited about that. Next slide, please. And so at this time, what I'd like to do is introduce our panelists. And I'll introduce the first one and then we will go in succession. So we have Erica McGrew. She is a first year finance doctoral student at the University of Memphis. And she attended the PhD Project Annual Conference in 2006 and was a member of the National Black MBA Association for the last 13 years. Erica, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, I'm so glad to be here today. And uh, you know, like she said that I'm a first year finance doctoral student at the University of Memphis. I'm heavily involved with the PhD project, the Finance Doctoral Association, as well as the National Black MBA Association here in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, I think we'll get more in depth into my experience at the PhD project annual conference in November, as well as things that I've done for the National Black MBA in the panelist portion. So now I will go ahead and hand it over to a fellow student, Mr. Larry Clay. Hi, my name is Larry Clay. Welcome you all to this panel discussion. Uh, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, actually, where I received my MBA at the University of Memphis. Uh, and currently, I am what you call ABD, all but dissertation, a PhD candidate at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, my interest of study is in management, and particularly in designing sustainable systems, which is a little bit of organizational designing, and some innovation into that. 
with an emphasis on sustainability. Now, I've been a member of the National Black NBA since 2013. And on the local level, I've been um, the local Memphis chapter. I've been uh, everything from a panelist speaker on economic development um, to a coach for the Leaders of Tomorrow program uh, in their case competition. But on the national level, uh, I've actually uh, held a position as the special operations manager for the Fiat Chrysler uh, graduate competition, uh, which has been a tremendous uh, impact on my life and my journey towards the PhD. And it's actually, uh, as I attended the NBA conference, uh, it's actually been the catalyst for propelling me towards the PhD project where I was invited to the 2015 PhD conference, uh, which led me to pursuing my PhD at Case Western. So I'm happy to continuously to be involved in both the PhD project and the National Black MBA. And with that, I'm gonna pass it to Dr. Gavin. Good afternoon. My name is Alex Gavin, and I am currently the director of the School of Accounting at James Madison University. Um, I was, I along with Tony Jackson and, and George Bradshaw back in 1970 organized a conference uh, of MBAs from around the country that resulted in the formation ultimately of the National Black MBA Association. So I'm very proud to be one of the legacy leaders and one of the people who was involved with the founding um, of our organization, a very distinctive and very productive organization. And also back in 1994, when uh, Bernie Milano called several faculty members from around the country together. And at that conference in Montvale, New Jersey, we talked about what is then going to become the Accounting Doctoral Student Association, which of course is what we're referring to now as a PhD project with all the different disciplines, business disciplines that are involved with that. So I got a chance to see at the front end the formation of two very, very uh, successful organizations. And, and the, the thing that is so fascinating for me at this moment is the actually be on a panel discussion where both of those organizations are coming together uh, for an opportunity to see to what type of synergy we might develop and, and, and go in that direction. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, um, presently in Virginia here at James Madison University. And, and I'm very excited to, to be part of it. In fact, I'm looking at a, a photo there uh, on the screen of when we uh, first were getting started with the, with the PhD project of the, those people who were the uh, signers uh, uh, or participated, I should say, with the uh, formation of the um, PhD project. So looking forward to our discussion today, looking forward to motivating and encouraging a number of you, hopefully, to actually consider this. And uh, I will tell you, you know, you know, I know I, we've got a lot that we're gonna be going through later today, uh, but in all honesty, in all honesty, if this shoe fits, if the shoe fits, I think you wanna go ahead and wear it because this could be something that is really, really fascinating and something that you could really enjoy and exciting. And we're already looking at winners because you're looking at MBAs. And so you know what it is to work, you know what it is to struggle, you know what it is to strive, you know what it is to win. And right now, if you're thinking about that PhD, we got something for you. So I'm gonna turn it back over now to Dr. Broxton and we're gonna continue with the program and hopefully give you enough information so that you can make an informed, good decision to get on in this water and start swimming with the rest of us. Dr. Broxton, it's yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Gavin. We really appreciate those comments and those, those, those heartfelt words. Um, so let's go ahead. What we wanna do now is provide, take about 20 or so minutes to have a quick discussion with our panelists. And so I'm gonna ask a few questions and I'm gonna ask for certain panelists primarily to answer and for others to join in as appropriate. So I wanna ask the three of you, why did you choose to go beyond an MBA and seek a PhD? Let's see, why don't we have Erica go first? 
I'm always the lucky one to go first, huh? <laughs> All right, so just a little bit more about my background. I do have an undergrad in electrical engineering from Tennessee State University. And then I did get my MBA in finance from Clark Atlanta University. And while I was at Clark, I was always the one, the person who was helping out the other MBA students, you know, teaching them, you know, some of the equations that we were learning, you know, because I had an engineering background, a lot of finance concepts came very easy to me. So I always had, I guess, like a passion and an urge for teaching. And when, while I was there, because my professors know that, noticed that about me, they were like, hey, we want you to go to the PhD project. So my faculty members actually encouraged me to go to the PhD project. And while I was there, I mean, I just was like, oh yes, this is, this is what I wanna do, <laughs> right? So um, at the conference in November, you get to, you know, learn everything that it comes that you need to know about obtaining your PhD from they have sessions on applying. So what are the different things you need to know about applying? They have uh, sessions on how to pick a, a academic advisors. They have sessions on how much it costs and what types of funding that you can get. So at the project conference in November, you're going to find out everything that you need to know. And then the second day at the conference, you're able to meet up with people who are in the discipline that you're interested in. So for every discipline, the application process can be different, the funding can be different, the requirements to graduate and you know publications can be different. So you're able to network with those people and so they can tell you specifically everything that you need. Now, also what I found with the PhD project is that faculty members who are already in place were willing to help me. So I could reach out to them after the conference and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. What are your thoughts? And they will provide me feedback right on the spot because one of the best things that you have to do when applying is express your research interest. So I would send the faculty members um, you know, a summary of what my interests were. And they look at the school and they say, yeah, I think that's a good fit. You should, you should go ahead and forward with that. So, um, you know, to answer your question, you know, what is it that made me move into the area of, um, you know, academia is one, because I believe in the vision of what the PhD project does. And I believe that we absolutely need people of color in front of the classroom. So the students um, know that uh, we are there. Uh, also, it gives you a diverse teaching style. It gives you diverse research interests. You know, it just brings that component. And because I just had a natural knack and a natural love and passion for teaching and doing the research on top of it, you know, be, being able to become a subject matter expert in a certain area because of the research that I do and the research that I will publish to the world uh, fascinates me as well. So that's just a little bit. There's so much more, but I don't want to take up time from everybody. Well, thank you, Erica. Let's see, Larry or Dr. Gab, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Sure, uh, I'll just add, um, add and preface that um, during my early life uh, and my early uh, stages in the professional world, I never thought or wanted to be a teacher, so to speak. So uh, it's funny how the environment and situations uh, change and how you should never say never. Um, Back in 2018, uh, I was definitely devastated by the uh, crisis that, that uh, came upon the US uh, economically and socially where I lost my job, uh, lost my house, lost, uh, lost my car, I lost everything. And I didn't know uh, what I really wanted to be in life because right? I didn't want to go back into um, the, the corporate atmosphere because I felt I had reached a reached the pinnacle of what I can do as far as being a manager. Uh, so I took the time to reflect on what I really wanted to do. And uh, I was a biology and chemistry major by trade in undergrad, but I needed to find a way that married uh, uh, things that I loved about the natural sciences and biology and the environment with business and innovation, which were my other passions. And the only thing that came to mind was to be a consultant. Well, I tried being a consultant after my MBA um, and tried to get positions, but they didn't work out. But during that experience uh, and through dialogue with other um, people, uh, I found that academia was the, the, my best route where I can continue to marry those three um, passions of mine, as well as have the um, variety and diversity of, of those things and to continue to develop it in generating new knowledge and also 
uh, being an advocate and a guidance uh, as a teacher and a professor uh, is actually the vocation of this whole uh, experience. So that's all I wanted to share at this time. And I'm glad that I did. In my case, I'm very much like most of you out there in the audience. I had my MBA, I was working in the industry. In fact, I was working in public accounting. Um, and so I was you know, going through that process. But th to answer the question, I really need to do it in two parts. The first part is what brought me into teaching. Why did I leave? Why did I take that MBA and leave the corporate area to go into teaching in the first place? And then why did I go after the PhD? So there are two parts of that. The first thing is that I decided after working in the industry for what I had seen, I knew I could teach black folks how to take some of them jobs. I knew I could go to a black school and teach young black folks how to get those doggone jobs because they had us always thinking you can't go into those white corporate environments because, hey, you know, y'all, 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 nothing. I saw enough stuff out there working in the environments I was in. I knew I could teach young black folk how to get some of those jobs. So I decided I was gonna go into teaching. And I looked at two schools in particular that really fascinated me. One was North Carolina A&T, Chrysler Craig at that point was getting ready to build a program down there and he turned that bad boy into something fantastic. But he interviewed and he offered me the position there so I could go on down to North Carolina A&T. And the other place was Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. Lincoln University was in a different situation altogether. They didn't have it, they just had a little small department. And for whatever reason, the spirit guided me to go to Lincoln, although I had a high regard for what Chrysler was doing down at A&T. So I went up to Lincoln University and I was the only person teaching all of the accounting courses to those students. But yet I knew I could get them ready to go into public accounting, I believe. And I just made it real, real clear to them. There ain't no way you're gonna be respected by anybody in accounting unless you take and pass the CPA exam. And so if you've got the hours out of the way, you got all the stuff out of the way, take and pass it, and then they gotta respect you. So I just worked on that. I taught all those courses, can you believe it? Tax, auditing, you know, intermediate, you know, all that. But that's okay. I acted as Pharaoh's, uh, 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 I acted like I was Pharaoh's guy to teach his son, and I was working with him. Now, because I'm competitive, the other thing that I felt is that, and I knew how things are out there, I didn't want my students to feel that they got shortchanged by not having what the white boys had. The white boys went to schools where they had doctors teaching them. That's how I got involved with, the P with a PhD. I said, well, if they gonna have folks saying that they got a doctor so-and-so who taught them, I'm gonna get me one of them things. I'm gonna get me a doctorate too. And so I worked full-time at Lincoln and went to one of the two schools in the nation that allowed you to go part-time to get a PhD, which was Temple University. They stopped doing it, but they did it at that time. So I worked for eight, nine years to get my PhD, driving from Pennsylvania and Lincoln up to, up to, uh, up to Philadelphia to work part-time in that program, taking courses every semester so that I could get the doctorate. I later found out that, I later found out that you know, and, and doing it that way, yes, I put a lot of time in. But in the process, I found out that that doggone PhD program was a valuable asset, not just for the prestige for the students to be able to say they took a doctorate. Boy, did you learn how to do some research. Boy, did you learn how to open up. And then when I finished up with my doctorate program, and got the doctorate, all of a sudden, then I got this opportunity to go and be a visiting professor down at JNU for a semester, came up for a year, came down as a visiting professor. I had planned on teaching and dying at Lincoln, but after I got my doctorate, went down to, to JMU, saw that there were some other things that I could perhaps be doing with the doctorate and all the rest of that, and so I went that way. And, but the doctorate turned out to be a phenomenal blessing for me in terms of all the things it opened up over and above everything else. So I love my 10 years at Lincoln. But if you go to a school like that, you don't need a doctor. That MBA and CPA was all they really required. If you had a doctorate, fine, but you didn't need one there. At a JMU and the kinds of other schools that you go from the PhD project, you gotta have a doctor. And so it's a whole different world. So you can teach. You can teach in some areas without a doctorate and Lincoln University was one of those places. But for other schools like this, you have to have it. And so that was a role I ended up playing when I came to it. But I think it turned out to be great. Yes, the impact you can have on students is just phenomenal. And so I went after the doctorate in order to be able to help the students, but it turned out to be a phenomenal blessing to me in the process. Thank you so much, Dr. Gavin.
This next question is for Larry and Erica. Can you describe the doctoral experience in two to three adjectives, please? Uh, I'll take this one first, Erica. Uh, three adjectives. Uh, difficult. Um, psychologically uh, intense, but rewarding. Erica, what about you? Okay, so before I describe it, I saw a question in the chat that I just like to answer really quickly. Someone okay. asked how old are how old is too old to start the PhD? I started the last year and I was 46 years old when I started. I'm 47 now, but I started at 46 years old. So like the other people on the panel, because I had my MBA, I worked for 15, 16 years before I went back. I wanted to get that industry experience before I got in front of the classroom. That was just a personal preference of mine. So I just feel like you're never too old. The years are gonna come and go regardless of whether you're in a PhD program or not. So why not just go ahead and do it if it's something that you're interested in. All right. So back to the adjectives, I'll say that the adjectives that I would use to describe the PhD program is um, uh, self-motivating, um, rewarding, and also disciplined. All right, thank you so much. And um, this is a question actually for me and Dr. Gavin. And Dr. Gavin, I'll have you go first and then you know, quickly and briefly, and then I'll, I'll respond also. The question is, well, as a, as a faculty member, can we describe what our life is like as a faculty member on our campuses or our life as a faculty member in terms of our research and our teaching and service and the like that we do? You have a lot of control over your life. That's the biggest thing. You get to choose almost like an entrepreneur how you wanna spend your time and put your effort because it's a whole variety of things. Every campus requires you to teach, gotta do it well. Every require, requires research, got to do it well. Requires service, got to do it well. But you get to choose within those areas what you want to do. So I think you've got a lot of variety, a lot of control over your life. And, that's, and if you want control, then I think that's it. You don't have a set time you have to do things. You know, you've got a lot of freedom. So I think that's a major difference between working in academia, from my experience, and working in industry. All right. And so in my case, I will say that, yes, being able to um, conduct research and to teach classes. And I'm actually in an administrative position now as well as a faculty member. So I have administrative duties in leading a program. Um, so in addition to that, of course, I still do my research. I teach classes on, you know, in the evenings for my, for my master's students and I lead the programs or during the day to office hours or the day hours. And I also conduct service work, you know, both within the Academy of Management and other associations to which I belong, as well as on campus and beyond my administrative role, I do serve on faculty committees. And, you know, again, faculty governance is key. Universities and colleges rely on faculty to be able to help govern the operations in general or the policies and how the procedures and how policies are upheld and how programs are developed and, grow, and how they grow and how we achieve the mission and vision of our respective business schools and campuses across the country. So that's one of the biggest things I do. But I love the, the ability, similar to what Dr. Gavin said, to be um, very autonomous. You know, I am an entrepreneur of my ideas and that allows me, and I've worked for, you know, quite a few universities in my 20 years or so as a professor. So I've been able to, take the knowledge that I've gained and the, the scholarship that I've produced and being a subject matter expert in the work that I do and been able to use that as my currency to be able to have a greater influence on what my life is like. So I've been able to have a better chance of being able to land um, academic opportunities that I thought would be more favorable for me and more advantageous for me and pleasurable for me to work in, in a city or a geographical location that would allow me to have that flexibility and equality work-life balance. Um, and outside of my administrative role, you know, being a full-time faculty member where your roles are to, to conduct research and teach and engage in faculty service, your time is your own. You have the flexibility of being able to oftentimes influence when you teach classes. And that's not to say you're not gonna work every day, believe me. We do put in oftentimes 
60, 70, 80 hours worth of work in a week, in a given seven day period. But at least we have flexibility in how we do that work and the motivation for why we do this work. You know, the intellectual stimulation, the ability to be able to give back to our communities and be able to make a difference in our communities and to have that intellectual, social, and social economic impact that we would not be able to otherwise have um, in the same capacity, mind you, if we stayed in corporate or worked outside of the academic arena. So I just want to be able to give those. Let's see. And one last question before we go to some of the um, questions that we received previously from, um, from our guest today. What attributes of the National Black MBA Association and the PhD project have you found to be most valuable to you along your journey? So I'm gonna ask this particularly to um, Alex and Larry given their um, direct connections uh, or extensive experience within the MBA program. And then Erica, you can elaborate. Sure. Um... I could continue the story of uh, how I got involved with the um, Fiat Chrysler case competition, which would be a good example uh, of this experience. Uh, after I received my MBA, uh, I was, you know, just just as hungry as anyone uh, that had. I had a job, but was looking for a better opportunity when I went to the conference. Uh, in doing so, I took the time to um, to uh, volunteer and use that as a service uh, in order to get my foot in the door. Because at the time I couldn't afford all of the, the lavishness and all of the parties and the, and the social connections uh, at, at that time. So I volunteered uh, and it just so happened that because I was the only one wearing a suit that day, the volunteer services um, in the NBA program, um, the people there say, hey, you're the only one with the suit um, and it's a requirement to wear a suit for the uh, case competition. So we're gonna send you over there. And I worked uh, for three days, uh, particularly on that project as a volunteer. Well, uh, apparently I did so well, it, for the next couple of conferences, I became volunteer lead uh, for the uh, BI case competition. Then I got promoted to uh, operations manager. Once, once I learned the tricks of the trade, and knew all the development and the logistics of uh, how to run the uh, case competition. And even this past year, when we um, had to move to the virtual platform, I was even involved in that and the background logistics to get it set up as well as uh, initiating and implementing the program. So with that being said, that provided me uh, an opportunity to not only talk to the students that were involved and interact with them, but I had conversations with the academic faculty that were advisors to uh, case competition members, uh, which happened to be some of the PhD project uh, and uh, minority faculty. Well, through the conversation, they just really reinforced, you know, why I shouldn't spend my time going to Google, Apple, and all of the different booths and standing in line for two or three hours for a two minute presentation uh, that, you know, it looks like what I wanted to do was to, um, was to become an academic to satisfy all of my, all of my needs. And ever since I took that advice and moved forward with it, you know, it's been nothing but uh, rewarding for me. So I just wanted to share that with you. I would say, I'm sorry, yes, Dr. Gavin. Yeah, I would say that in terms of attributes of both organizations, I think that good people, you need to sort of like step back and recognize something. And that is, if you are a member of the National Black MBA Association, and you're thinking about joining the PhD project and becoming a member of that, for both organizations now, you've got to go ahead and understand just how rare you are. You are extremely rare. This situation that's set up in the country for the most part is not designed with your success in mind. You have beaten all kinds of odds. And for you to be sitting there with an MBA right now, I already know that you are fulfilling that talented tenth mentality that the boy talked about because you have overcome an awful lot of things to get where you are. 
And all that you're trying to do now is decide whether or not you're going to pivot and transition from that, from all you've learned, into this other environment that requires the exact same type of attributes. You're winners. You win. You play hard and you're not likely to be easily defeated. That's how you got there. And so if, if I had to say what's similar for both type of organization, black folk who hungry to win and succeed. That's what I think is there. And I think that's what you have. And I think that's what you want to use to carry forward. So all we're trying to do now is decide what's the best environment for you to do your thing. You know, and that's why if you come to the PhD project, that's an organization that's designed to nurture, guide, and help direct you in making decisions to go there. It's a facilitator, you know, for you to go there. It's what your daddy and mama couldn't do at home because they didn't go through that process. So they can't talk to you about that across the table. At the PhD project, they can't. You got somebody who cares about you. You got somebody who's been there, who's done that. And they hook you up with folks who look just like you and hook you up with other folks of goodwill. And they all come together and say, we're going to help you do just what you want to do. We're going to help you succeed at this thing. And it is difficult. Playing that doggone game out there is no doggone joke. Ain't nobody sitting up over that doctor got that doggone thing for free. Ain't no doggone affirmative action like people want to think it is. Oh, yeah, yeah, because no, 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 no. You earn that, man. Yeah, this is a degree, huh? I was gonna say, I'm sorry, Dr. Gay. I'm just gonna say just quickly, this is a degree that you don't technically earn. This is a degree that is conferred upon you by a group of your peers. She is so right. This is I'll so the, you don't check the boxes day. off like Good. a master's degree or undergraduate degree. This is a degree where you during the doctoral process, think of this as if you're in the trades. You are an apprentice during the doctoral program and you are learning from master craftsmen or crafts people. Going through that dissertation, the whole doctoral journey, coursework phase, comprehensive exams, and the dissertation phase. Once you are, once you defend it and then they say, congratulations, doctor so-and-so, you are no longer an apprentice. You are now a journeyman. And then from there, during your your first years as a professor, as assistant professor, before you go up for tenure and promotion, that's when you're actually really mastering, you know, learning how to master the craft. You know, so it's one thing to learn the tools and the trip and the and the tricks and the I won't say tricks, but learn the knowledge and skills and tools to be able to perform the duties, and then then be put in a position where you're able to actually practice that, and then to get to the point where you also then become a master craftsman when you get tenure and promotion after typically five to seven years, 10 years in some other cases, at some places. But this is a degree where you are an aspiring peer. Your professors and the, those who are in lead, you know, a part of your committee and your doctoral program training, they're training you like an aspirant peer. And they are able to decide at the end all and be all is the work that you do is can you demonstrate, yeah. can you demonstrate yeah. Yeah. That you have the knowledge, the skill sets, yeah. and the tools to be able to be an independent scholar like them. I'm and so only sure. once, and only at that point, once they have that confidence mm -hmm. in you to say that yes, they can attest and affirm that you have the knowledge and skills and tools to be able to yes, you can do conduct research on your own, you can explore questions, you can lead in the classroom, and you can be a purveyor of not just a creator, but also a purveyor and disseminator of knowledge. That's when they say, you now have this doctorate. It has now been conferred upon you. You don't technically earn it. I am so glad she said that. I am so glad she said that. I am so glad she said Look ahead. That is the one part of that thing that nothing you've done has prepared you for. And she is absolutely so right. They actually say whether or not it's okay. And if they don't say it's okay, it's over. Oh, oh, oh she's so right. She's so right. Thank you. No problem. And so I know we are kind of cutting short on our time. So I uh, apologize to Ms. Groove for not being allowing and giving the opportunity to ask that question. But I want to be able to at least provide um, there are a couple of questions that were in that we received previously that um, I wanna quickly answer and then I wanna do a quick wrap up and then be able to direct all of you who have taken the time out of your schedule today 
to um, listen to this webinar and listen to us to direct you to some websites and some and places where we can answer or you can get some additional questions answered um, beyond what we're talking about today or given the time. Um, so one of the major questions that I know we received earlier is, are there scholarship funding available? So yes, let me provide, um, let me be a myth buster very quickly. Yes, with business doctoral programs, those at Research One institutions, those that are, that are um, accredited by AACSB, which is those are the universities for which, through which the PhD project is affiliated and work with and partner with. The overwhelming majority of those programs will offer tuition remission and fee remission. So no, you do not pay tuition for um, your programs. Now there are some schools where you may have to pay some fees or a small portion of your tuition, but overall the majority of PhD business programs particularly at, again, research one institutions, you do not pay tuition. You also will earn a stipend um, through assistantships, whether as a teaching assistant or as a research assistant with one or more professors. So you will um, be able to earn some funding, um, a stipend. And the, the range is you know, as low as $15,000 to as high as $40,000. And there may be some other fellowships available that are grants that you don't have to pay back. Um, but generally, um, and maybe you know the the range may vary based on cost of living and where you're li where you're where you're going to school, um, but nonetheless you are able to at least earn some money. I will be honest with you. We will all be honest with you. The overwhelming majority of PhD business programs at research one institutions are full time. There's only a very small handful of PhD program business programs that are not full time. So there is an investment. We say it's an investment. We don't say it's a, a sacrifice. We say it's an investment that um, during those four to five, and in some cases, in some places, six years, that you are a doctoral student. You are not expected to work outside of your program because this is a full-time commitment. Treat it like a job. We treat it like a job and have treated it. Dr. Gabb and I did treat it like a job. So you really will not have, not have time to be able to work a full-time job, let alone a part-time job. And most programs will require that you do not work. So does that take some preparation and some um, mindfulness and thoughtfulness in planning this process? Yes. So during the November conference, if you apply for the November conference, we'll be able to provide you a wealth of knowledge and information and guidance and some tidbits of how you can prepare for this process. So this is something that you have a calling for, which we hope you do. We hope that you have this calling, that you don't have to do this right away. You can get the information from the conference and the information we provide and use it as a stepping stone to prepare long-term what it will take for you to go through this process. Um, so I wanted to make sure I did answer that question very quickly. Um, and let's see, and then what I wanna do is one more last question and then I will do a quick wrap up. And I'll ask the panelists to ask um, to answer this question. Let's see. Actually, I'll let's see. Let me answer this question here. Are you able to get special concentrations for um, areas outside of the business school? So I think someone mentioned, like for instance, questions on IO psych, you know, IO psychology and, and other disciplines. Yes. So depending on the school, depending on the program you may be able to actually study um, a supporting discipline outside of the business school. I know we talked a little bit about that earlier, but I wanted to make sure we answered that question. And I know there are several questions within you know, the chat. Um, and there, you know, we wanna answer as many questions as we can, but we are buttressing toward our hour and we wanna be able to respect everyone's time. So let me just go through a few things quickly as we wrap up that, to direct you to get some more information. So first of all, we definitely want to encourage you to apply to attend the annual conference, which is usually typically held in November of each year. To be eligible to apply for the conference, you must be Black African American, Latinx, Hispanic American, or Native American. You must be a US citizen or permanent US resident. And if you are in your senior year of college, you know, you, know, you need to be in your senior year of college, pardon me, by the time you attend the college, or you must already possess a minimum of undergraduate degree. So there are some senior students, some students who are in pursuing their undergraduate degree 
and they're in their senior year. So at a bare minimum, you must be in, um, in your senior year of your undergraduate program in order to apply um, to be accepted to come to the conference. Um, but yes, at a minimum, you need an undergraduate degree otherwise. Next slide, please. And so for this year, our conference will take place November 17th through 19th in Chicago. And so the conference invitation is available. You can go to phdproject.org to actually ac access um, the application. And it's by invitation only. So during the application process, you'll submit the application. And there are quite a few pieces to the application. So we encourage you to start early in the application process. Don't Please don't wait until the last minute because there are some questions where you definitely need to provide some thought and the like. So do that as soon, you know, explore it now. You know, you can, do, you know, complete it piecemeal, but submit it no later than September 30th. And the, the individuals who review um, these applications, they're heads of doctoral programs, and in some cases, deans of doctoral programs. So they do the screening process and they're looking at your application as a preliminary round is as they will look at it, applicants to their respective doctoral programs. So you'll get a good sense of um, what an actual doctoral program application looks like by looking at our application. If you are selected to attend the conference, you will be expected to and required to pay a registration fee of $200 if it's in person. And if by chance our conference is virtual this year, then there'll be a $50 fee and we'll process via credit card. And this is considered what we see as your investment um, in this process. And so if you enter a full-time AACSB accredited business doctoral program within three years of attending the conference, then your fee that you pay to attend the conference will be reimbursed to you. And again, the registration fee is $200, but if you are a full-time student and you can provide evidence that you're a full-time student, then we will waive the registration fee. Next slide, please. So we appreciate this opportunity that you've taken the time to meet with us today and to at least get some inspiring words and some detailed information about um, what the PhD program is, you know, PhD projects about, as well as primarily and specifically academic careers and pursuing an academic career in business and the impact that you can have, not just on your own life and your family's lives, but the lives of students, the next generation of employees and workers and leaders and your communities at large. And so what we'd like to do, please stay connected with us. Please visit our website at www.phdproject.org. Again, if you visit our website, there are a number of, of resources available, video clips, testimonials, frequently asked questions. So there are a number of questions that we couldn't get to today that some of you submitted. There are several questions that are available um, in terms of that can be answered through our website. And yes, please follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And we also, of course, are very thankful for this partnership that we have forged with the National Black MBA Association. So please, if you're not already a member of the National Black MBA Association, please visit the National Black MBA Association website at nbmbaa.org. So nbmbaa.org. And you can contact um, LaPray George, I mean, LaPray directly at his email address as listed here. Um, with that, I wanna say thank you so much for your time. Um, I will make available very quickly within the chat, my email address so that if by chance, there are any additional specific questions that any of you may have that for whatever reason we weren't able to answer today and that we can't answer or you may not be able to answer, receive answers from through the phdproject.org website please feel free to contact me. And I have no doubt that the other panelists will be welcoming and willing to, um, to answer any questions that you may have of them, but I definitely want to invite you or um, permit you to um, email me as well. So with that, thank you so very much for this opportunity. Um, I'm been, it's been a pleasure to be your moderator for this session and I wish you all a wonderful day. Thank you so much.
And thank you again, Dr. Bloxen, Dr. Gavin, um, soon to be Drs. Clay and Dr. McGrew, um, as well as uh, Blaine Ruchak with PSU Project. Thank you as well for, for you all's time today. So you'll get an, uh, an email after the session ends with a quick survey to complete about the session. I have a feeling that we had, you know, with so much interest in this uh, opportunity, we're going to likely have another session like this in the, in the near future, because I think the, the response has been overwhelming. We had almost 500 people that registered for this event, and over 200 that actually attended. So we know the interest is there, so we want to keep this momentum going. Um, again, do the survey when it comes out. I'll also include everyone's contact details in an email separately, so you can email them directly to have any additional questions answered. So again, Dr. Bloxham, thank you very much for moderating today's session. Uh, and again, thank you, all, Dr. Gavin, uh, Larry, and Erica for you all's input throughout the session as well. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all for staying a little bit over time with us. Take care, everyone. Thank you all. Thank Take you. Care. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe and healthy.